Have you ever felt like corporations get away with everything? That no matter what terrible crimes they commit, no one faces any consequences? Well, that isn't always the case. Today, let's look at some of the largest corporate scandals and white collar crimes, and the few times where they didn't quite get away with it. This is The Corporate Scandals Iceberg Explained. But first, consider subscribing to the channel. It's free, and you'll get more stories, scandals, mysteries, and icebergs straight from the vault to your feed. Let me know if you have more ideas in the comments, and enjoy the video. Let's start off with level one, stories you've probably heard before, and might even be familiar with. Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart's insider trading scandal dates back to 2001, and revolves around her sale of iMClone Systems stock. iMClone, a biopharmaceutical company, was awaiting a decision from the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, regarding the approval of its new drug, Airbitux. Stewart was a close friend of Samuel Watskull, the CEO of iMClone at the time. In December 2001, just one day before the FDA announced its decision not to approve Airbitux, Martha Stewart sold around 4,000 shares of I'm Clone stock. The timing of her sale raised suspicions, as it suggested she might have had insider information about the FDA's decision. Stewart initially claimed that the sale was based on a pre-existing agreement with her stockbroker, Peter Bakanovic, to sell the I'm Clone stock if it fell below a certain price. However, investigations revealed inconsistencies in her statement. It was later uncovered that Bakanovic had tipped her off about the impending negative news related to iMClone, which prompted her to sell her shares. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, and the Department of Justice, the DOJ, launched investigations into the matter. In June 2003, Martha Stewart and Peter Bakanovic were indicted on charges including securities fraud, obstruction of justice, and making false statements to federal investigators. Stewart faced additional charges related to her public statements defending her actions. In March 2004, Martha Stewart was found guilty on charges of obstructing justice and lying to federal investigators about the circumstances of her I'm Clone stock sale. She was sentenced to five months in prison, five months of home confinement, and two years of probation. Additionally, she faced fines and a ban from serving as the director, CEO, or CFO of any public company for a period of five years. The Martha Stewart insider trading scandal not only had legal consequences for Stewart and Bakanovic, but also had a significant impact on Stewart's reputation and her business empire. The case highlighted the importance of maintaining integrity in financial transactions and the serious consequences of insider trading in the business world. While Martha Stewart might have been known for baking a mean banana bread, in the next topic, bananas are a key ingredient to overthrowing the government. Chiquita Banana Chiquita Banana, formerly known as the United Fruit Company, also had its own scandal. The United Fruit Company scandal, also known as the Banana Massacre, unfolded in the early 20th century and was a pivotal moment in the history of corporate exploitation and political manipulation in Latin America. The United Fruit Company, an American corporation, played a central role in this controversial episode. The roots of this scandal can be traced back to the late 19th century, when the United Fruit Company, under the leadership of Samuel Zamuri, established a dominant presence in the Central America and Caribbean regions. The company controlled vast banana plantations, railways, and ports, wielding, wielding significant economic and political influence in the region. It became colloquially known as the octopus, due to its far-reaching tentacles. The United Fruit Company's power was not limited to economic matters. It extended into the political realm, through strategic alliances and manipulation, the company often dictated policies to protect its interests. One notable example is the role the company played in the overthrow of the Guatemalan government in 1954. The democratically elected president, Jacobo Arbenz, aimed to implement agrarian reforms that would redistribute land, including that owned by the United Fruit Company. Fearful of losing their lucrative holdings, the company lobbied the U.S. government to intervene, leading to the infamous CIA-backed coup. The most egregious incident associated with the United Fruit Company, however, occurred in Colombia in 1928, known as the Banana Massacre. 
the company's mistreatment of its workers and harsh labor conditions had long been a source of tension. In response to labor strikes demanding better wages and working conditions, the Colombian government, with the support of the United States, authorized the use of military force. The Colombian army, acting on behalf of the United Fruit Company, brutally suppressed the strike, resulting in the deaths of an estimated 1,000 to 2,000 workers. The Banana Massacre brought international attention to the exploitative practices of the United Fruit Company and fueled anti-American sentiments in Latin America. The incident highlighted the collusion between multinational corporations and governments, raising questions about the ethics of corporate power and foreign intervention. In the aftermath of these events, the United Fruit Company faced increased scrutiny and condemnation. The transformation of the United Fruit Company into Chiquita Brands International occurred in 1984, when the company underwent a rebranding effort. Facing a tarnished reputation due to its involvement in controversial political and labor incidents, the company sought to distance itself from its past. The decision to adopt the name Chiquita was part of a strategic marketing move to create a friendlier and more consumer-oriented image. The Chiquita Banana brand, with its iconic blue sticker featuring the animated Miss Chiquita character, aimed to shift public perception and emphasize a focus on quality and freshness rather than the contentious history associated with the United Fruit Company. Moving from one fruit to another, bananas to apples. Scandals are everywhere. Battery Gate The term Battery Gate became widely known in 2017 when it was revealed that Apple had intentionally slowed down older iPhone models through a software update. The controversy, which raised questions about planned obsolescence and transparency in the tech industry, had significant repercussions for Apple's reputation and led to various legal challenges. In December 2017, iPhone users began noticing that their old devices were experiencing slower performance after installing the latest iOS updates. Some speculated that this slowdown was a deliberate move by Apple to encourage users to upgrade to newer models. Apple intentionally attributed the performance issues to aging batteries, stating that as batteries degrade over time, they may not be able to handle the peak power demands required for optimal performance. As public frustration mounted and skepticism grew, a Reddit post gained attention, suggesting that replacing the iPhone's battery with a new one significantly improved performance. This revelation triggered a wave of controversy and led to accusations that Apple was engaging in planned obsolescence, deliberately designing products to have a limited lifespan to drive more frequent upgrades. In response to the outcry, Apple issued a public apology in December of 2017. The company explained that it had implemented power management features in older iPhones to prevent unexpected shutdowns caused by aging batteries. While Apple insisted that the intention was to prolong the overall lifespan of devices, the lack of transparency about these performance-throttling measures fueled the battery gate scandal. As a gesture of goodwill, Apple offered a reduced price for battery replacements and introduced a battery health feature in iOS, allowing users to monitor and disable performance throttling. However, the damage to Apple's reputation was already done. The incident triggered numerous class action lawsuits, investigation by regulatory authorities in various countries, and intensified the ongoing debate about consumer rights, transparency, and ethical practices within the technology industry. In March 2020, Apple agreed to settle a class action lawsuit in the United States, agreeing to pay up to $500 million to affected iPhone users. The settlement addressed claims of both intentional slowdowns and the lack of disclosure about the performance management features. I guess we should be glad those batteries didn't catch fire, like our next topic. Fire Festival The Fire Festival scandal, unfolding in April of 2017, is synonymous with a catastrophic failure in event planning and marketing. Organized by entrepreneur Billy McFarland and rapper Ja Rule, the event was promoted as a luxury music festival set on a private island in the Bahamas, featuring top-tier musical acts, gourmet cuisine, and upscale accommodations. The reality, however, was starkly different, resulting in a chaotic and disastrous experience for attendees. The promotional campaign for Fire Festival, fueled by social media influencers and models, presented an idyllic paradise that promised an unparalleled luxury experience. 
Ticket prices ranged from $1,500 to $250,000, attracting high-profile influencers, celebrities, and music enthusiasts. As attendees arrived on the island, they were met with a scene that starkly contrasted the glamorous promises. The accommodations were substandard to say the least, resembling disaster relief tents rather than the promised luxury villas. The gourmet cuisine was replaced with meager, unappetizing food, and the event lacked essential infrastructure such as a proper sanitation and medical facility. The festival grounds were incomplete, and musical acts were either cancelled or never scheduled to perform in the first place. The island, which was initially described as a private and exclusive one, turned out to be a disorganized and overcrowded space. Social media played a pivotal role in the unraveling of the Fire Festival. Attendees took to platforms like Twitter and Instagram to share images and stories of the chaotic conditions, creating a viral storm of public outrage. The hashtag Fire Festival became a symbol of the stark dissonance between the extravagant promises made by the organizers and the harsh reality faced by festival goers. In the aftermath of the debacle, Billy McFarland faced legal consequences. In October 2018, he was sentenced to six years in federal prison after pleading guilty to multiple counts of wire fraud and defrauding investors. The festival's failure also resulted in numerous lawsuits from attendees and business partners seeking compensation for financial losses and damages to their reputations. The Fire Festival scandal serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of overpromising and underdelivering, particularly in the age of social media. It highlighted the ethical responsibilities of event organizers and the potential consequences of deceptive marketing. All right, lots of fire in this video, but this next one is explosive. Ford Pinto. The Ford Pinto scandal, which unfolded in the 1970s, is a notorious case in automotive history that spotlighted corporate decision-making prioritizing profits over safety. The scandal involved the Ford Motor Company's compact car, the Pinto, and the ethical questions surrounding its design and production. In the late 1960s, as the automotive industry faced increasing pressure to produce smaller, fuel-efficient cars in response to changing consumer demands and rising fuel prices, Ford introduced the Pinto in 1971. However, internal documents later revealed a deeply troubling decision-making process related to the Pinto's fuel tank design. The Pinto's design flaw centered on the placement of its fuel tank, which was located behind the rear axle. This configuration made the tank susceptible to rupture in the event of a rear-end collision, leading to high risk of fires. Shockingly, Ford was aware of this potential danger during the car's development, but opted against making necessary design changes to save costs and meet production deadlines. The ethical breach became glaringly apparent in 1977 when a groundbreaking expose by Mother Jones magazine exposed Ford's internal memos and calculations. The documents revealed that Ford had conducted a cost-benefit analysis weighing the expenses of redesigning the Pinto against potential legal costs for injuries and deaths resulting from accidents. The calculations demonstrated a disturbing conclusion, that it would be more cost-effective for Ford to pay settlements to victims than to invest in improving the safety of the vehicle. The revelation sparked public outrage and legal action. Ford faced numerous lawsuits from victims of Pinto-related accidents. The scandal prompted a reevaluation of corporate ethics and responsibility in the automotive industry. The public's trust in Ford was significantly damaged, and the Pinto became a symbol of corporate callousness and negligence. In response to the crisis, Ford initiated recalls and implemented safety improvements on later models. However, the damage to the company's reputation was lasting. The Ford Pinto scandal remains a cautionary tale in business ethics, underscoring the importance of prioritizing consumer safety. Like the Ford Pinto, this next scandal also released tons of fumes. And that brings us down to level two. Dieselgate. The Volkswagen emission scandal, also known as Dieselgate, rocked the automotive industry when it came to light in September 2015. The scandal involved the German automaker Volkswagen and its subsidiary Audi, which were found to have deliberately manipulated emission tests on their diesel vehicles to meet regulatory standards. 
Volkswagen had long marketed its diesel vehicles as environmentally friendly, touting their low emissions and fuel efficiency. However, it was revealed that Volkswagen had installed a defeat device in millions of diesel cars globally. This software could detect when the vehicle was undergoing emissions testing and would adjust the engine performance to meet the required standards. During regular driving conditions, the cars emitted pollutants, including nitrogen oxides, at levels significantly higher than allowed by environmental regulations. The scandal first came to public attention when researchers at West Virginia University, working with the International Council on Clean Transportation, conducted real-world emission tests on VW vehicles and discovered the wide gap between laboratory results and on-road emissions. The United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, subsequently issued a notice of violation to Volkswagen. As the scandal unfolded, it was revealed that the deceptive software had been installed in approximately 11 million vehicles worldwide, affecting the various VW brands including Audi, Porsche, and Skoda. The fallout from Dieselgate was swift and severe, leading to financial, legal, and reputational consequences for Volkswagen. Volkswagen faced a barrage of lawsuits and regulatory fines globally. In the United States alone, the company agreed to pay billions of dollars in settlements, including compensation for affected vehicle owners and environmental remediation efforts. Several executives, including CEO Martin Winterkorn, resigned or were suspended, and the company's stock value plummeted. The scandal had far-reaching implications for the automotive industry, prompting increased scrutiny of emissions testing procedures and pushing other manufacturers to reassess their practices. It also sparked debates about the effectiveness of regulatory oversight and the balance between environmental responsibility and economic considerations within the industry. In response to the crisis, Volkswagen pledged to shift its focus towards electric vehicles and clean technologies. The scandal served as a wake-up call for the automotive sector, highlighting the importance of ethical practices, transparency, and adherence to environmental standards. Cars have been somewhat of a theme so far, and this next topic is no exception. Prius Unintended Acceleration In the mid-2000s, some Toyota and Lexus vehicles, including the Prius, were reported to experience unintended acceleration. While this issue was not specifically related to a brake failure, it generated significant public concern and led to a major recall by Toyota. The controversy gained momentum in 2009, when multiple reports surfaced of drivers claiming that their Toyota vehicles, including the Prius Hybrid, accelerated uncontrollably despite their attempts to brake. These incidents were linked to unintended acceleration, where drivers asserted that the vehicles seemed to accelerate on their own, making it difficult for them to bring the car to a stop. The media coverage and public discourse surrounding these reports prompted an investigation by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA. The investigation aimed to determine whether there were any underlying issues with the electronic throttle control systems in certain Toyota vehicles that could lead to unintended acceleration. In 2009 and 2010, Toyota recalled millions of vehicles worldwide to address the unintended acceleration issue. The company attributed the problem to mechanical factors, including floor mats, that could entrap the accelerator pedal, causing unintended acceleration. Toyota implemented various remedies, including modifications to the accelerator pedals, changes to the floor pan design, and the installation of brake override systems. The Toyota Prius, as part of this recall, received modifications to address potential pedal entrapment and to enhance the brake override system. The brake override system was designed to ensure that if both the accelerator and the brake pedals were depressed simultaneously, the brake would take precedence, allowing the driver to regain control of the vehicle. The unintended acceleration issue significantly impacted Toyota's reputation for safety and reliability. The company faced criticism for its handling of the situation and its perceived lack of transparency. The recall and subsequent investigations prompted a broader industry-wide discussion on the safety of electronic throttle control systems and the need for rigorous testing and oversight. Now, speed can kill, but so can salmonella. How's that for a transition? The Peanut Corporation of America 
The Peanut Corporation of America scandal in 2008 to 2009 was a significant food safety crisis that exposed egregious violations of health and safety standards within the peanut processing industry. The Peanut Corporation, now a defunct company based in Georgia, was at the center of the controversy, which led to one of the largest food recalls in U.S. history. The scandal began when various peanut products produced by the Peanut Corporation were linked to a widespread outbreak of salmonella contamination. The outbreak resulted in hundreds of reported cases of illness across multiple states and was linked to several deaths. The contaminated products included peanut butter, peanut paste, and other peanut-derived ingredients distributed to a wide range of food manufacturers, retailers, and institutions. The investigation that followed uncovered a shocking pattern of negligence and deliberate misconduct within the Peanut Corporation of America. The company was found to have knowingly shipped products contaminated with salmonella even after receiving positive test results for the bacteria. In some instances, the company engaged in the practice of retesting batches that had initially tested positive until they obtained a negative result, allowing the distribution of potentially hazardous products. The Peanut Corporation scandal exposed critical weaknesses in the food safety regulatory system, particularly the limited resources and oversight capabilities of the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA faced scrutiny for its inability to prevent the distribution of contaminated products and for not having the authority to mandate recalls. The fallout from the scandal had severe consequences for the Peanut Corporation of America and its executives. The company filed for bankruptcy in 2009, and its top officials, including CEO Stuart Parnell, faced legal action. In 2014, Stuart Parnell was convicted on multiple federal charges, including conspiracy, wire fraud, and obstruction of justice. He received a 28-year prison sentence, one of the harshest penalties ever imposed on a corporate executive in a food safety case. In response to the scandal, there were calls for comprehensive reforms to the food safety systems in the United States. In 2011, the Food Safety Modernization Act, FSMA, was signed into law, providing the FDA with increased authority and resources to enforce safety regulations, conduct inspections, and respond more effectively to food safety issues. The Peanut Corporation of America remains a stark example of the devastating consequences of corporate misconduct in the food industry. It's also not the only company that struggled to contain the spread of something. Up next is the spread of an ecological disaster. BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill The Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill, one of the largest environmental disasters in history, unfolded in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. The incident was triggered by the blowout of the Macondo Well, located deep beneath the Deepwater Horizon offshore drilling rig, operated by BP, British Petroleum. The catastrophic event had severe ecological, economic, and social repercussions. The disaster began on April 20th, 2010, when a blowout preventer, a critical safety device, failed to control the release of high-pressure methane gas. The ensuing explosion and the fire on the Deepwater Horizon resulted in the loss of 11 crew members' lives and the sinking of the rig two days later. The blowout continued, releasing vast amounts of crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico. BP initially struggled to contain the oil leak, and various attempts, including the top kill and junk shot methods, proved unsuccessful. The unchecked flow of oil persisted for 87 days until a temporary cap was successfully placed over the wellhead on July 15, 2010. Over this period, it's estimated that approximately 4.9 million barrels of oil were discharged into the Gulf. The environmental impact of the Deepwater Horizon spill was devastating. The oil slick covered extensive coastal areas, harming marine life, including fish and birds and marine mammals. The delicate ecosystems of coastal wetlands and estuaries were severely damaged, and long-term consequences were experienced for the biodiversity of the region. The spill also had significant economic ramifications, particularly for the fishing and tourism industries, as well as the livelihood of coastal communities. The Deepwater Horizon disaster prompted extensive legal and financial consequences for BP. The company faced a multitude of lawsuits and claims for damages from affected individuals, businesses, and governments. In 2012, BP agreed to a settlement with the U.S. Department of Justice, committing to pay over $4 billion in fines and penalties. 
The incidents also led to increased scrutiny of the oil and gas industry's safety practices and regulatory oversight. It highlighted the need for more robust safety measures, improved contingency planning, and enhanced transparency in the exploration and extraction of offshore oil and gas resources. Speaking of disasters with global consequences, our next topic moves from the physical world to the digital one. The Facebook Cambridge Analytical scandal, which emerged in 2018, revealed egregious mishandling of user data and sparked widespread concerns about the privacy, data protection, and the ethical responsibilities of technological companies. Cambridge Analytica, a political consulting firm, had obtained and exploited the personal data of millions of Facebook users without their explicit consent. The firm accessed this information through a third-party app called This Is Your Digital Life, which was designed as a personality quiz. While the app collected data from users who participated in the quiz, it also harvested data from the friends of those users, creating a vast trove of personal information. The scale of the breach was staggering, affecting an estimated 87 million Facebook users globally. The information collected included not only personal details about users' preferences, but also their interests and potentially their political affiliations. Cambridge Analytica then used this data to create targeted political advertising and influence campaigns during the 2016 U.S. presidential election and other political events. The scandal exposed serious flaws in Facebook's data protection practices and raised questions about the platform's oversight of third-party apps. Critics argued that Facebook had failed to adequately safeguard user data and had been negligent in monitoring how developers were utilizing the platform for data collection and analysis. As a consequence of the scandal, Facebook faced intense scrutiny from lawmakers, regulatory bodies, and the public. CEO Mark Zuckerberg testified both for U.S. Congress, acknowledging lapses in the company's data protection measures and vowing to take corrective actions. Facebook implemented various changes, including stricter privacy controls, increased transparency, and a review of third-party app access. The fallout extended beyond Facebook, contributing to a broader public discourse about the impact of social media on democracy, the ethical use of data in political campaigns, and the need for comprehensive data protection regulations. The incident prompted discussions about the power of tech companies, their responsibilities to users, and the potential for misuse of personal information for political purposes. In response to the scandal, there were increased calls for regulatory reforms to safeguard user privacy and hold tech companies accountable for data breaches. The European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, implemented in May of 2018, represents one such response, imposing stringent requirements on companies handling the personal data of EU citizens. Government intervention and oversight could have played a key role in preventing the next one on our list. And that moves us down to level three. Lehman Brothers. The Lehman Brothers scandal in 2008 marked a pivotal movement in the global financial crisis, triggering a cascading series of events that led to widespread economic turmoil. Lehman Brothers, a prominent investment bank, faced insurmountable financial difficulties due to its exposure to subprime mortgage-backed securities and a significant decline in the value of its assets. As the financial crisis deepened in 2008, the Lehman Brothers found itself at the epicenter of the storm. The firm had heavily invested in mortgage-backed securities tied to the U.S. housing market. As the subprime mortgage market collapsed, the value of those securities plummeted. The erosion of Lehman Brothers' capital base and its inability to secure additional funding left the bank in a precarious position. In a desperate attempt to salvage the situation, Lehman Brothers sought assistance from the U.S. government and potential buyers. However, the government, led by the U.S. Treasury and Federal Reserve, was unwilling to provide a bailout similar to those given to other financial institutions earlier in the crisis. Prospective buyers were also hesitant to acquire Lehman Brothers given the uncertainty surrounding its financial health and the toxic assets on its balance sheet. On September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy marking the largest bankruptcy filing in U.S. history at the time. The bankruptcy had far-reaching consequences, causing shockwaves throughout the global financial system. The interconnectedness of financial institutions meant that Lehman Brothers' collapse had a domino effect, exasperating the ongoing credit crunch and intensifying the severity of the economic downturn. 
The Lehman Brothers' bankruptcy contributed to a loss of confidence in financial markets, leading to a freezing of credit markets, bank failures, and a deepening recession. Governments around the world were forced to intervene with massive financial bailouts and stimulus packages to stabilize their economies. The crisis led to a severe contraction of global economic activity, widespread unemployment, and a protracted period of financial uncertainty. In the aftermath of the Lehman Brothers scandal, there were increased calls for financial regulatory reforms to prevent reoccurrence of such a catastrophic event. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, signed into law in 2010, aimed to address some of the systemic issues that contributed to the financial crisis, including enhancing regulatory oversight and promoting financial stability. Moving from financial health to your physical well-being, the next one on our list tricked just about everyone. Theranos. The Theranos scandal, one of the most high-profile cases of corporate fraud in recent years, involved the biotech startup Theranos and its founder and CEO Elizabeth Holmes. The company, founded in 2003, promised to revolutionize the healthcare industry by providing fast, affordable, and minimally evasive blood testing, using just a few drops of blood. However, it was later revealed that Theranos had engaged in widespread deception about the capabilities of its technology. Theranos claimed to have developed a revolutionary blood testing device named the Edison, capable of conducting a wide range of tests using small amounts of blood. The company garnered significant attention and investments, reaching a valuation of nearly $10 billion. Holmes, hailed as a visionary and compared to Steve Jobs, became one of the youngest self-made female billionaires. The scandal began to unravel in 2015 when investigative journalism by the Wall Street Journal exposed the discrepancy between Theranos' claims and the actual performance of its technology. Former employees and whistleblowers revealed that the Edison device was far from reliable and that Theranos had manipulated test results. The company was using commercially available machines for many tests instead of its proprietary technology. In the wake of the revelations, regulatory bodies, including the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, conducted investigations. The accuracy and reliability of Theranos' tests were called into question, leading to the suspension of its clinical lab operations and the banning of homes from owning or operating a clinical lab for two years. Theranos faced a series of legal actions, including a class action lawsuit by investors and a lawsuit by the SEC, alleging elaborate and years-long fraud. In 2018, Holmes settled with the SEC, agreeing to pay a $500,000 fine, return 18.9 million shares of Theranos stock, relinquish her voting control of the company, and relinquish her claim to certain Theranos stock. In September of 2018, the SEC charged Theranos and Holmes with an elaborate years-long fraud, alleging that they raised more than $700 million from investors through an elaborate scheme. Holmes settled the charges without admitting or denying wrongdoing, agreeing to pay a $500,000 fine and returning 18.9 million shares of Theranos stock. Additionally, Holmes was barred from serving as an officer or director of a public company for 10 years. Speaking of public health and safety, the next company on our list disregarded both. Boeing 737 MAX crashes. The Boeing 737 MAX crashes represent a tragic series of aviation disasters that unfolded in 2018 and 2019, involving two fatal crashes within a span of five months. The crashes, Lion Air Flight 610 in October of 2018, and Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 in March 2019 raised serious concerns about the safety of Boeing 737 MAX aircraft and led to a global grounding of the entire fleet. The Boeing 737 MAX was introduced as an updated version of the highly successful 737 series, incorporating new engines and aerodynamic enhancements to improve fuel efficiency and operational performance. However, a key feature of the 737 MAX known as the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, MCAS, came under intense scrutiny following the crashes. The MCAS was designed to automatically adjust the aircraft's angle of attack to prevent stalling in certain flight conditions. However, a critical flaw in the system, coupled with inadequate pilot training and information, led to the tragic incidents. 
In both crashes, the MCAS was activated to erroneous sensor data, causing the aircraft to enter a nosedive that pilots struggled to recover from. The investigation into the Lion Air and Ethiopian Airlines crashes revealed commonalities in the technical issues and highlighted failures in the regulatory oversight process. Boeing faced criticism for not adequately informing pilots about the MCAS system and for not providing proper training for handling potential malfunctions. Additionally, concerns were raised about the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, and their certification process, suggesting a cozy relationship between Boeing and the regulatory authorities. In response to the crashes, the Boeing 737 MAX fleet was grounded worldwide in March 2019. The company faced intense scrutiny from aviation regulators, lawmakers, and the public. Boeing acknowledged the issues with the MCAS and committed to addressing the software and training deficiencies. The company worked closely with aviation authorities to develop software updates and revised pilot training programs to enhance the safety of the aircraft. From one crash to another, our next item is a story of deception in the most dramatic fashion. WeWork The WeWork scandal leading up to its financial turmoil and failed attempt at an initial public offering, an IPO, in 2019 was characterized by a combination of corporate governance issues, questionable financial practices, and concerns about the leadership style of co-founder and then-CEO Adam Newman. WeWork, initially positioned as a provider of flexible shared office spaces, expanded rapidly under Newman's vision to transform it into a global tech and real estate giant. However, the company's meteoric rise came under scrutiny as its financial health and corporate governance practices were brought into question. One significant issue was the company's financial structure and valuation. WeWork, despite massive losses, portrayed itself as a tech company rather than a traditional real estate firm. This valuation strategy raised eyebrows among investors and analysts who questioned the sustainability of WeWork's business model, especially given its staggering losses and high lease commitments. Concerns about corporate governance were highlighted by Newman's controversial leadership style. Reports emerged about Newman's self-dealing, including leasing properties he owned back to WeWork and his involvement in trademarking the term We and then selling it to the company for millions. The company's corporate governance practices were seen as lacking, with Newman having considerable control over decision-making, including the ability to appoint his successor. As WeWork prepared for its highly anticipated IPO in 2019, its financial disclosures came under intense scrutiny. The company's prospectus revealed massive losses, complex financial arrangements, and a lack of clear path to profitability. Investors became increasingly skeptical, and the IPO faced a significant loss in confidence. Amidst growing concerns, WeWork postponed its IPO in September of 2019. Shortly afterward, Newman stepped down as CEO, and the company's valuation plummeted from a peak of $47 billion to a fraction of that amount. SoftBank, a major investor in WeWork, took control of the company and infused it with a financial rescue package to prevent its collapse. WeWork's struggles and financial turmoil ultimately led to its withdrawal from the public markets and a significant restructuring. The company faced challenges in retaining tenants, renegotiating leases, and restoring investor confidence. In May of 2020, WeWork reported a net loss of $2.1 billion for the first quarter of that year, further highlighting the ongoing challenges. Then, if you're listening in November of 2023, they have recently declared bankruptcy. But... Was it all a lie? Well, if it wasn't, this one certainly was. Bernie Madoff The Bernie Madoff scandal, one of the most notorious financial frauds in history, unfolded in the early 21st century and exposed a massive Ponzi scheme orchestrated by Wall Street financier Bernard Madoff. Madoff, a former chairman of NASDAQ and the founder of the Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, LLC, defrauded thousands of investors, institutions, and charities of billions of dollars over several decades. Madoff's scheme was a classic Ponzi scheme, where returns to existing investors were paid using the capital from new investors, rather than any profits from any legitimate business activity. The facade of his investment strategy involved the creation of consistent, high returns, leading many investors to believe they were part of an exclusive and lucrative investment opportunity. The unraveling of Madoff's scheme began in December 2008, 
when, in the midst of global financial crisis, he confessed to his sons that the investments were a fraud. Facing redemption requests he couldn't meet, Madoff could no longer sustain the illusion. His sons reported the fraud to authorities, and on December 11, 2008, Bernie Madoff was arrested by the FBI. The scale of the fraud was staggering. Madoff admitted to a loss of nearly $65 billion in principal investments, through the, though the true figure may never be known. The victims included individuals, charities, celebrities, and institutional investors who had trusted Madoff with their savings and investments for years. Notable victims included prominent figures like Steven Spielberg. In 2009, Bernie Madoff pleaded guilty to 11 federal felonies, including securities fraud, wire fraud, and money laundering. In June 2009, he was sentenced to 150 years in prison, a de facto life sentence given his age. The court-appointed trustee tasked with recovering funds from the victims, Irving Pickard, worked to identify and liquidate Madoff's assets to compensate defrauded investors. The Bernie Madoff scandal had profound consequences on the financial industry, leading to increased scrutiny of investment practices and regulatory reforms. It also fueled skepticism about the credibility of high-profile investors and financial institutions. The financial scandal doesn't stop there, though. Up next is one of the most recognizable and infamous financial frauds in history. Enron The Enron scandal of the early 2000s stands as one of the most infamous corporate fraud cases in history, exposing widespread accounting irregularities, corporate misconduct, and the failure of regulatory oversight. Enron Corporation, once hailed as an innovative and financially successful energy company, collapsed in 2001 under the weight of its deceptive financial practices. Enron, founded in 1985, rapidly ascended to become one of the largest and most admired companies in the United States. However, behind its facade of success, the company engaged in complex and deceptive accounting practices to inflate its profits and hide its mounting debt. Enron's leadership, including CEO Jerry Skilling and Chairman Kenneth Lay, fostered a culture of aggressive risk-taking and financial engineering. One key element of Enron's downfall was the extensive use of Special Purpose Entities, SPEs, which were off-balance sheet entities created to hide debt and project losses. The company manipulated these entities to conceal its financial weaknesses and present a more favorable image to investors and analysts. Additionally, Enron engaged in mark-to-market accounting, which allowed the company to book anticipated future profits immediately, even before the projects generated income. As Enron's financial troubles deepened, it became clear that the company had overstated its profits and concealed massive debts. In August 2001, CEO Jeffrey Skilling resigned, citing personal reasons, and Enron's stock began a precipitous decline. In October 2001, the company reported a third quarter loss of $618 million, leading to a further plunge in its stock value. In December 2001, Enron filed for bankruptcy, making one of the largest bankruptcies in U.S. history. Thousands of employees lost their jobs, and investors suffered massive financial losses as the stock became virtually worthless. The Enron scandal also had a cascading effect on Arthur Anderson, the accounting firm responsible for auditing Enron's financial statements. Arthur Anderson faced criminal charges for its role in the accounting irregularities and eventually went out of business. And our next case of financial fraud happened around the same time. And it also brings us all the way down to level four. WorldCom The WorldCom scandal, which unfolded in the early 2000s, ranks among the most significant corporate fraud cases in history revealing massive accounting irregularities and executive misconduct. WorldCom, a telecommunications giant, engaged in fraudulent financial practices that ultimately led to its bankruptcy in 2002. The roots of the scandal can be traced back to WorldCom's aggressive expansion strategy in the 1990s. As the company acquired a series of telecommunication firms, it amassed substantial debt and faced intense pressure to meet financial expectations. To conceal the true extent of its financial difficulties, WorldCom engaged in fraudulent accounting practices under the leadership of CEO Bernard Ebers and CFO Scott Sullivan. The primary accounting manipulation involved capitalizing normal operating expenses as long-term investments, artificially inflating the company's reported assets. 
WorldCom also manipulated its earnings by hiding expenses and inflating revenue through improper accounting entries. These deceptive practices created a distorted picture of WorldCom's financial health, leading investors and analysts to believe the company was much more profitable and stable than it actually was. The scandal came to light in June 2002, when Cynthia Cooper, WorldCom's internal auditor, discovered irregularities in the company's accounting records. Cooper and her team brought their findings to the attention of WorldCom's board of directors, prompting an internal investigation. In July of 2002, WorldCom admitted to improperly accounting for nearly $4 billion in expenses and concealing more than $11 billion in liabilities. The revelation of the accounting fraud sent shockwaves through the financial markets. WorldCom stock, which had been among the most widely held and traded, became virtually worthless. The company filed for bankruptcy in July of 2002, marking the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history at the time. In the aftermath of the scandal, several executives, including CEO Bernard Ebers and CFO Scott Sullivan, faced legal consequences. Ebers was convicted on charges of fraud, conspiracy, and filing false documents with regulators. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison, one of the harshest penalties for corporate fraud at the time. Sullivan also received significant prison sentence for his role. The numbers just keep going up. The next company on our list paid one of the largest fines in corporate history. The Texaco Lago Agrio Incident The Texaco Chevron scandal, often associated with the Lago Agrio oil field in Ecuador, is a protracted and complex environmental and legal dispute that spans several decades. The controversy revolves around allegations of environmental pollution and its impact on indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest. In 1964, Texaco, later acquired by Chevron, entered into a partnership with the state-owned oil company PetroEcuador to extract oil from the Lago Agrio region. Over the next three decades, Texaco operated in the area, and by the time it left, in 1992, it was accused of engaging in extensive environmental practices that resulted in widespread contamination of the land and water. The indigenous communities and local residents in the affected areas particularly the Amazon rainforest, alleged that Texaco deliberately dumped oil-related waste, including toxic drilling muds, into open pits and rivers. The disposal practices, they argued, led to severe environmental degradation, soil contamination, water pollution, and adverse health effects for the local population. The legal battle began in 1993, when a group of Ecuadorian plaintiffs filed a lawsuit against Texaco in the United States. The case was later moved to Ecuador, and in 2011, an Ecuadorian court initially awarded the plaintiffs a historic $19 billion judgment. However, Chevron refused to accept the ruling, vehemently denying the allegations and accusing the Ecuadorian legal system of corruption and misconduct. Chevron argued that it inherited the responsibility for any environmental remediation from Texaco, and that a 1998 agreement with the Ecuadorian government absolved it of any further liability. The oil company countersued, taking the case to various international tribunals to challenge the validity of the judgment. The legal saga continued, with twists and turns in multiple jurisdictions. In 2018, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague ruled in favor of Chevron, stating that the 2011 judgment from Ecuador violated international law and that the country should take steps to prevent enforcement of the judgment. While the legal battle had shifted focus over the years, the environmental and social impacts on the affected communities persist. The Texaco Chevron scandal remains emblematic of the challenges associated with multinational corporations operating in ecologically sensitive areas and the protracted legal battles that often ensue. Companies fight over the money, and people are left suffering. Moving on to something a little bit more lighthearted, and moving from petroleum oil to vegetable oil, the next company on our list is truly one of the more hilarious corporate cons I've ever heard of. The Great Salad Oil Swindle the salad oil scandal of the 1960s, also known as the Great Salad Oil Swindle, was a financial fraud that rocked the commodities market and exposed a massive scheme orchestrated by Anthony Tino DeAngelis. This scandal involved the falsification of inventory records related to salad oil, deceiving banks, and trading partners, and causing substantial financial losses. DeAngelis, the mastermind behind the scam, was the president of Allied Crude Vegetable Oil Refining Corp., a company that dealt in vegetable oils, including soybeans and cottonseed oils. 
His fraudulent scheme involved using the same tanks to store both water and salad oil, manipulating the inventory records to make it appear as if large quantities of valuable salad oil were stored there. Anthony Tino DeAngelis orchestrated a scheme where he would cover large amounts of water with a very thin layer of salad oil in storage tanks. The deceptive practice allowed him to create the illusion of having large quantities of valuable salad oil in inventory, which he then used as collateral to secure loans from banks and to sell fraudulent warehouse receipts in the commodities market. This fraudulent activity created a pyramid effect where the inflated value of the non-existent salad oil was used to secure even larger loans and engage in more extensive trading. The scheme began to unravel in 1963 when certain creditors and inspectors began to question the actual existence of the salad oil claimed by DeAngelis. When the truth emerged, it sent shockwaves through the financial and commodities markets. The losses were staggering, with estimates ranging from 150 to 175 million, making it one of the largest financial frauds of its time. Several major financial institutions, including American Express, suffered substantial losses as a result of the salad oil scandal. The fallout from the scandal led to significant changes in banking practices, including increased scrutiny of collateral and improved risk management protocols. Anthony Tino DeAngelis was eventually arrested and charged with fraud and conspiracy. In 1965, he pleaded guilty to multiple counts of fraud and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. The next one is about as nerdy a scandal as you can expect from a computer company. HP Spying Scandal The Hewlett-Packard spying scandal, also known as the pre-texting scandal, unfolded in 2006 and revealed a series of ethically dubious and potentially illegal activities conducted by the company in an attempt to identify the source of an information leak. The saga began when confidential information from HP board meetings was being leaked to the media, to trace the leaks, then-CEO Patricia Dunn and the company's senior management initiated an investigation. However, the methods employed were highly controversial and crossed ethical and legal boundaries. HP hired external investigative firms, including one called Action Research Group, to conduct the probe. These firms engaged in what they called pretexting, a method involving the use of false pretenses and deceptive tactics to obtain private information. In this case, investigators impersonated HP directors, journalists, and employees to gain access to their phone records and personal information. The scandal became public when it was revealed that the private investigators hired by HP had used pretexting to obtain the phone records of board members, journalists, and employees. This revelation sparked a significant public outcry, leading to congressional hearings and legal repercussions for those involved. Patricia Dunn faced intense scrutiny and eventually resigned as a chairwoman of HP's board of directors into September 2006. The fallout extended to others involved in the investigation, including HP's chief ethics officer, Kevin Hunsaker, who also resigned. Criminal charges were filed against several members, including Dunn and four investigators, accusing them of identity theft and conspiracy. In 2007, Patricia Dunn and three others reached a settlement with the California Attorney General Office agreeing to pay fines and undertake community service. The charges against the fourth investigator were dropped. Now, on to our last topic, truly one of the most despicable cases I've ever heard of. Thankfully, there was just a little bit of justice served, though likely not enough. Valiant Pharmaceuticals Price Gouging The Valiant Pharmaceutical scandal, which unfolded in 2015, exposed a web of aggressive business practices, accounting irregularities, and unethical conduct that led to the company's downfall. Valiant, under the leadership of CEO Michael Pearson, pursued a strategy of rapid acquisitions and significant price hikes on existing drugs, drawing intense scrutiny from regulators, investors, and the public. Valiant's business model relied on acquiring established pharmaceutical companies and then substantially raising the prices of their drugs. This strategy, often referred to as buy and raise, aimed to maximize profits by exploiting gaps in the healthcare system and taking advantage of the lack of price controls on prescription medications in the United States. One of the most notorious instances involved two heart drugs, Nitropress and Isoprel, for which Valiant raised prices by 525% and 212%, respectively, shortly after acquiring them. The exorbitant price increases drew widespread criticism and triggered investigations into Valiant's pricing practices. 
In addition to pricing controversies, Valiant faced allegations of improper accounting and financial practices. The company was accused of creating a network of specialty pharmacies, including Philidor RX Services, to inflate its sales figures by forcing distributors to purchase excess inventory. This practice artificially boosted Valiant's reported revenues, creating a facade of sustained growth and profitability. The revelations surrounding Valiant's business practices led to a sharp decline in its stock price and increased regulatory scrutiny. The company's market value plummeted by more than 90% within a year, wiping out billions of dollars in shareholder value. Valiant became a symbol of corporate excess and greed in the pharmaceutical industry. In 2016, Valiant appointed a new CEO, Joseph Papa, <laughs> to lead a turnaround and address the company's mounting challenges. Valiant's response included divesting non-core assets, renegotiating debt agreements, and adopting new ethical guidelines. The company also changed its name to Bosch Health Companies in 2018 as part of a broader rebranding effort. And that's all of them. If you made it to the end, thanks for watching. There are so many more that didn't make the cut. Maybe I'll need to make a second video on the rest of them. Was one of your favorites missing? Let me know in the comments. And before you go, if you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing. It means the world to me. See you next time.